I'm Dick Campbell from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Welcome to another one of my Great Moments in History presentations. For the past 74 years, I have been a student of history. And with this interest, since 1999, I have now created a variety of 10 history talks, which I presented many times to local Oshkosh community groups and other organizations throughout Wisconsin and even up in Fairbanks, Alaska. And now I'd like to share one of these moments with you entitled, The Story of the Wright Brothers and How They Gave Us Wings. Before the Wright Brothers, no one in aviation did anything fundamentally right. Since the Wright Brothers, no one has done anything fundamentally different. A quote by Daryl Collins, U.S. Park Service, Kitty Hawk National Historical Park. To simply say that the Wright brothers invented the airplane doesn't begin to describe their many accomplishments, nor is it especially accurate. The first fixed-wing aircraft, a kite, mounted on a stick, was conceived and flown a century before Orville and Wilbur Wright made their first flights. The Wrights were the first to design and build a flying craft that could be controlled while in the air. Every successful aircraft ever built since, beginning with the 1902 Wright glider, has had controls to roll the wings right or left, pitch the nose up or down, and yaw the nose from side to side. <clears throat> These three controls, roll, pitch, and yaw, let a pilot navigate an airplane in all three dimensions. The entire aerospace business depends on this simple but brilliant idea today that was invented by the Wright brothers 112 years ago. This is their story. Wilbur and Orville Wright were the sons of Milton and Susan Wright and members of a warm and loving family that encouraged learning and doing. In 1859, they settled on a farm at Fairmont, Indiana. Milton was a bishop in the United Brethren Church and was often away from home on church business. And because of his position in the church, the Wrights were a family on the move. In 1867, they moved to Millville, Indiana. A year later, to Hartsville, Indiana. And the year after that, 1869, to Dayton, Ohio, where they bought a new house on Hawthorne Street. In, eight, <clears throat> in 1878, the family temporarily moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa for three years, then moved to Richmond, Indiana, for three years, until they returned for good in 1884 to their home in Dayton, which had been rented on the family's departure from Dayton in 1878. From then on, this would be home for Wilbur and Orville Wright. Milton and Susan had seven children together, Ruchlin, Lauren, Wilbur, Orville, and Kathleen, including a set of twins named Otis and Ida, who died in infancy. Wilbur was born in 1867 in Millsville, Indiana. Orville was born in Dayton, Ohio in 1871. Today, when most people think of the Wright brothers, they picture the intelligent, successful inventors of the first powered airplane. So you might be surprised to hear that Orville and Wilbur Wright were once mischievous students who never officially graduated from high school. Wilbur finished four years of high school, but the family moved from Richmond, Indiana back to Dayton in 1884, before he could receive his diploma. Incidentally, 
A diploma was finally awarded to Wilbur Wright on April 16, 1994, on his, what would have been his 127th birthday. Orville, although in, in, intellectually curious, dropped out of high school in 1889 before completing his senior year to start his own print shop in the carriage shed behind their house. He designed and built his own printing press using a discarded tombstone, a buggy spring, and scrap metal with Wilbur's help. Wilbur eventually joined Orville's printing business and they began publishing the West Side News, a weekly paper for the residents of West Dayton, Ohio. The brothers' newspaper collaboration marked the beginning of their lifelong partnership. Then in 1893, when bicycling had become very popular, the enterprising Wright brothers put their friend Ed Sines in charge of their printing business and opened a bicycle repair and sales shop, the Wright Cycle Company, in Dayton, Ohio. Eventually, by 1896, they were building and selling their own brand of custom-made bicycles. They were to continue to be active in the bicycle business from 1893 to 1907. They used this endeavor to fund their growing interest in flight. This was the perfect occupation for them because it involved one of the exciting mechanical devices of the time, the bicycle. When they took up the problems of flight, they had a solid grounding in practical mechanics and knowledge of how to build machines. Their work with bicycles in particular influenced their belief that an unstable vehicle, like a flying machine, could be controlled and balanced with practice. They began to read everything they could find on the subject of flight. Another earlier life incentive to their interest in flight occurred in 1878 when their father brought home a toy helicopter for the boys that he tossed in the air. Instead of falling to the floor as expected, it flew across the room till it struck the ceiling, where it fluttered a while and finally sank to the floor. Made of paper, bamboo, and cork, with a rubber band to twirl its rotor, it was about a foot long. Orville, age eight, and Wilbur, age 12 at that time, played with it until it broke, and then they built their own. This was the first powered aircraft they built together. In later years, they pointed to their experience with this toy as the initial spark of their interest in flight. <coughs> Once when caught by his teacher working on his toy helicopter in class, Orvo explained that one day he and Wilbur planned to build a machine big enough to fly and carry both of them. With two successful businesses, the brothers could afford to spend time on their other interests. They read everything they could get their hands on concerning aviation and aeronautics. They were especially interested in the experiments of other flight inventors, such as Octave Chanute in the United States and Otto Lilienthal in Germany. They were devastated when Lilienthal was killed in 1896 in a glider accident. Wilbur spent days in the library studying Lilienthal's designs and concluded that the trick to successful flight would be inventing a plane you could control and power. The Wright brothers would spend the next 13 years of their lives pursuing that dream. After Lilienthal's death, the brothers became more interested in his dynamic gliding experiments in Germany and with Chanute's testing of various types of gliders over the sand dunes along the shores of Lake Michigan. These events lodged in the consciousness of the brothers for several years. They became eager for more information, so Wilbur wrote a letter to the Smithsonian Institution on May 30, 
1899, requesting information and publications about human flight. Two key points in this letter shown here were, quote, I have been interested in the problem of mechanical and human flight ever since, as a boy, I constructed a number of helicopters of various sizes after the style of Cayley's and Pernald's machines. My observations since have only convinced me more firmly that human flight is possible and practicable." Unquote. And another point by Wilbur was, quote, I am an enthusiast but not a crank in the sense that I have some pet theories as to the proper construction of a flying machine. I wish to avail myself of all that is already known and then, if possible, add my might to help on the future worker who will attain final success." Unquote. A Smithsonian official, Richard Rathbun, responded to Wilbur's letter on June 22 by sending several pamphlets and a list of books. Thus ended what one Wright's Wright Brothers biographer has called, quote, the most important exchange of correspondence in the history of the Smithsonian, unquote. Rathbun had just played a major role in the transformation of the entire world. With this information, the brothers began their mechanical experimentations that year. They spent three months in 1889, 1899 studying the work of their predecessors. A successful flying machine was clearly going to require control in all three axes of motion, pitch, yaw, and roll. Other experimenters had understood the importance of pitch and yaw in their attempts of flight. The Wright's experience with bicycles indicated that roll control was also going to be very important. On the basis of observation, Wilbur concluded that birds changed the angle of their wings to make their bodies roll right or left. The brothers decided this would also be a good way for a flying machine to turn, bank, or lean into a turn just like a bird. And just like a person riding a bicycle, an experience with which they were thoroughly familiar. They puzzled over how to achieve the same effect with man-made man wings and eventually discovered wing warping when Wilbur idly twisted a long inner tube box at the bicycle shop. He happened to place the thumb and forefinger of one hand on diagonal corners at one end of the box and the other thumb and forefinger on the opposite diagonal corners at the other end. He noticed that when he squeezed his thumbs and forefingers together, the box twisted. The surfaces at each end rotated in opposite directions. The biplane was essentially a box with open sides. And with a set of cables, he could twist the wings just as he twisted the box. When one wing turned up, this would increase the lift at the end. Where the other tip turned down, the lift would decrease. The difference in lift would cause the biplane to roll to the right or to the left. And from this observation, Wilbur discovers a simple method for changing the angle at which the wings of an aircraft meet the wind, wind, enabling a pilot to roll into a turn. This is the beginning of a revolutionary new control system for airplanes. <clears throat> In July 1899, with this drawing pictured here, Wilbur built a model five-foot wingspan biplane glider as a kite with strings attached, allowing for con the control of wing twisting, and he tested it in a field near Dayton, Ohio. The control system worked, and with Orville's help, 
they built a full-size man-carrying glider. In November 1899, the brothers determined that to fly their gliders safely, they need a location with high winds to launch them and soft ground to land them. They contacted the United States Weather Bureau for information on wind conditions in various places. Kitty Hawk, on the outer banks of North Carolina, some 700 miles from Dayton, was one of the windiest places in the country. It also had high, treeless sand hills for launching their gliders and broad sand beaches for soft landings. To be certain Kitty Hawk was the right choice, Wilbur wrote to Joseph Dasher, the head of the Weather Bureau office, which was located in the life-saving station at Kitty Hawk, pictured here. Dasher answered reassuringly about steady winds and sand beaches, and that Kitty Hawk also offered all the isolation one might wish for to carry an experimental, on experimental work in privacy. The information also included a kind invitation from the postmaster, William Tate, and his family, pictured here, along with a promise of help from the men of the Life Saving Service station nearby, which the Wrights eagerly accepted. In the final weeks of 1899 and early 1900, the brothers built a full-size glider with two wings that they intended to reassemble and fly at Kitty Hawk, first as a kite, then, if all went well, fly themselves. Then in September 1900, they traveled to Kitty Hawk and began reassembling their first glider in William Tate's front yard, using Addie Tate's sewing machine to stitch together the glider's wing fabric. In October 1900, they set up their first camp tent and then set out to test their man-carrying biplane glider as a kite at Kill Devil Hills, about four miles south of Kitty Hawk. With everything in place, the first glider consisted of two fixed wings, one above the other, each measuring five by 17 feet. In addition, it had warping controls and a movable horizontal elevator in front of the glider. There were no wheels for takeoffs or landings. Instead, the machine had wooden skids, far better for sand. They flew their machine like a kite with lines hanging down to the ground by which they could work the steering apparatus. The glides were unspectacular, no more than 200 feet long, but they gave the brothers their taste of flight. The glides were un <clears throat> they then packed for home, certain they would return. Their machine, having more than served its purpose, was left behind, and Bill Tate was told the materials were his to use as he wished. From the undamaged portions of the cotton sateen wing covering, Addie Tate was to sew dresses for their two daughters. In July 1901, the brothers returned to Kitty Hawk with their second and new larger glider, hoping the increased wing area would produce more lift. Here's a great picture of Wilbur in, the, in flight that summer. But again, their glider fell short of expectations. The Wrights began to suspect the information that aeronautical scientists in the past had developed to design aircraft particularly the lift tables, were incorrect. Then in August 1901, Octave Chanute visited the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk and watched them fly. Chanute was one of the world's leading authorities on aviation and on gliders, gliders in particular. Although the Wrights themselves were disappointed with the performance of their new glider, Chanute was enthralled. He was impressed with the nature and number of their aeronautical experiments. In 1901, the Wrights were back in Dayton, feeling like failures and uncertain whether to continue. 
when Chanute invited Wilbur to present a scientific paper to the Western Society of Engineers. Wilbur's presentation, entitled, quote, Some Aerial Experiments, unquote, aroused much interest, particularly when Wilbur challenged the accuracy of the lift tables that other scientists have accepted as gospel. In the words of a latter-day aeronautics specialist at the Library of Congress, Wilbur's speech was the, quote, book of Genesis of the 20th century Bible of aeronautics, unquote. From October to December 1901, Orville and Wilbur, having questioned traditional aeronautical wisdom, set out to find the truth. They devised and built a small-scale wind tunnel, pictured here up in the upper part of the slide, a wooden box six feet long and 16 inches square, with one end open and a fan mounted at the other end to test for lift and drag in the wing foils. They made preliminary tests on over 200 wing shapes and then thoroughly investigated 57 of them the most promising. The airfoils inside the wind tunnel were made of sheet metal. In the process, they identified errors in accepted information from previous inventors and then established a body of accurate data from which to design aircraft in their open workshop, pictured here. The work was unlike anything the brothers had ever undertaken and the most demanding of their time and powers of concentration. As said later by a major aeronautical publication, quote, never in the history of the world had men studied the problem with such scientific skill, nor with such undaunted courage, unquote. From June to August 1902, after a busy season for their bicycle business, the brothers began to build their third glider. This is the first aircraft they have designed using the information from their wind tunnel experiments. It is also the first aircraft since their model glider to have a tail, two fixed vertical surfaces in the rear. In September 1902, the Wrights were back in Kitty Hawk and began to fly their third new machine. Here's another great picture of Orville taking off in that glider. It is an enormous improvement over the previous gliders, providing adequate lift for long rides. However, they still have problems with control. When they turn the glider, sometimes it stalls and dives to the ground. In October 1902, to prevent this diving problem, they converted the fixed tail to a movable rudder, and they linked the rudder to the wing warping controls so that whenever the pilot warped the wings by means of a wooden hip cradle, the rudder would pivot to the appropriate direction to assist in turning the glider not coincidentally like the use of the hips in maneuvering a bicycle. Here's a close-up of Wilbur as he flies with wing warping to control roll, an elevator for pitch, and a rudder for yaw, making the 1902 Wright Glider the first aircraft ever with three-axis control. The Wrights began to truly fly making over 1,000 glides, some over 600 feet, before returning home. After completing over 2,000 practice glides, similar to this picture of Wilbur at the controls above their camp buildings below, they departed, Dayton, they departed back to Dayton on October 28, 1902, in a frame of mind far different from what it had been at their departure the year before. All the time and effort given to the wind tunnel tests, the work designing and building their third machine, and the last modifications made at Kill Devil Hills 
had proven entirely successful. They knew exactly the importance of what they had accomplished. They knew they had solved the problem of flight and more. They had acquired the knowledge and skill to fly. They could soar, they could float, and they could dive and rise, circle and glide, and land, all with assurance. Now, they had only to build a motor. In December 1902, after having returned to Dayton, the brothers sent out letters to the leading internal combustion engine manufacturers around the world, soliciting information on obtaining an engine producing eight horsepower and weighing no more than 180 pounds. They discovered that no such engine existed. All existing engines were either too heavy or too weak. So they had to build their own. They turned to their mechanic, Charlie Taylor, Taylor pictured on the left here, who produced one in just six weeks in close consultation with the brothers. Here was where Charlie Taylor's superior mechanical skills came into play as he took charge of transforming the brothers' plans into a workable engine by using a lathe and drill press. It had four cylinders and developed 12 horsepower. To keep the weight low enough, the engine block was cast from aluminum, a rare practice for the time. Now they had their engine. Confident that their new engine was strong and light enough to power a glider, the brothers next had to design a propeller. No data on air propellers was available, so they found themselves working in a theoretical vacuum. They painstakingly worked out their own theory, treating the propeller as a rotary wing and using much of the same information that they had developed for designing efficient aircraft wings. They selected the shape of propeller D in this picture. They realized that the thrust generated by a propeller when standing stationary was no indication of the thrust when in motion. The only way to really test the efficiency of a propeller would be to actually try it on a machine, shown here in this slide. In 1903, the brothers built the powered Wright Flyer I from an initial sketch drawn on a sheet of brown wrapping paper using their preferred material for construction, spruce, a strong and lightweight wood, and pride of the West muslin for surface coverings. Compared with the propulsion challenges, the airframe frame of the new airplane represented simply a larger expansion of the 1902 glider and was built with reinforced ribs, longer landing skids, a double surface rudder, and a weight of about 675 pounds. The pilot still lay prone in a hip cradle offset just to the left of the aircraft's center line, and the engine counterbalanced him by being offset to the right. A small fuel tank containing about one gallon of gasoline was mounted to the top of the left inboard wing strut feeding the engine by gravity. And a radiator ran vertically along the right inboard strut. The two counter-rotating propellers were positioned between the two wings just to the rear of the pilot. Each had a diameter of eight and one-half feet and was made of spruce lamentations glued together and shaped by hand with a hatchet and spoke shaver as used by wheelwrights. The two drive chains for the propellers, the left one crossed to make the props rotate in opposite directions, were specially made by the Indianapolis Chain Company and were patterned after bicycle chains. They finished the new aircraft over the summer of 1903 and then in late September left with it for their camp at, at the Kill Devil Hills 
where they arrived on September 25. The shed on the left was used to rebuild and house the flyer, which is pictured here outside. The shed on the right included a camp kitchen, showing their typically ordered way of doing things, with everything in its place. They endured weeks of delays caused by broken propeller shafts during engine tests. After the shafts were replaced, requiring two trips back to Dayton, Ohio, Wilbur won a coin toss and made the first flight attempt on December 14, stalling after takeoff after only three seconds, causing minor damage to the aircraft shown here. Many would have been happy to claim this as a first flight, but not the brothers. The next attempt came on December 17. The day was freezing cold, 33 degrees at 8 o'clock, with a 27 mile an hour wind gusting across the hills from the north. Winter was settling in, and the Wrights were running out of time to make a first flight before having to break camp and return to Dayton. Reflecting on the moment long afterward, Orville would express utter amazement over, quote, our audacity in attempting flights in a new and untried machine under such circumstances, unquote. But nothing was going to stop them now, and they pressed on. Working together, and they and five men from the Kill Devil Hills Life Saving Station hauled the flyer to the launching rail track, which was four 15-foot long 2 by 4s sheathed with a metal strip and laid down on a flat level strap, stretch west of the camp. John Daniels, pick, circled here, waited by a camera, perhaps little realizing that he would capture one of the most important images ever on film. Orville had positioned Daniels and the Corona cam camera on its wooden tripod about 30 feet from the end of the starting rail and assigned him to squeeze the rubber bulb to trip the shutter as the flyer passed that front, that point. Orville carefully got on the machine and lay down in the hip cradle, his left hand holding a vertical level lever on his left that controlled the front elevator. With his right hand, he started the engine by moving a small horizontal lever on the wing to open a fuel cock. Behind him, Wilbur swung one of the propellers and the engine fired. At 10.35 a.m., Orville moved the starting lever and the flyer began moving down the launching rail track, guided underneath the aircraft by two bicycle wheel hubs. Wilbur ran alongside, steadying the right wing. At the end of the rail, the flyer lifted into the air and John Daniels, who had never operated a camera until now, snapped the shutter to take what would be one of the most historic photographs of the century. A photocopy of Daniels' original partially broken glass plate is shown here on this slide. This first flight traveled 120 feet and lasted only 20 or 12 seconds. But it was nevertheless the first in history of the world in which a machine carrying a man had raised itself by its own power into the air in full flight, had sailed forward without reduction of speed and had finally landed at a point as high as that from which it started. Three more flights were made that day, with Orville and Wilbur taking turns as pilot, covering 175 feet on flight two, 200 feet on flight three, and by Wilbur covering 852 feet in 59 seconds at noon on the last flight of the day, pictured here. Wilbur's landing broke the front elevators of the flyer, as pictured here, 
The brothers and the five life-saving crew members then hauled the flyer back to their camp from its fourth flight. And suddenly, a powerful gust of wind flipped it over seven t several times, despite the crew's attempt to hold it down. Severely damaged, the airplane never flew again. The brothers shipped it home and put it in storage in Dayton. Years later, in 1916, Orville restored it and lent it to several U.S. locations for display purposes. Then in 1928, the airplane was placed on loan to the Science Museum in London, England for 20 years, pictured here in that museum. During World War II, the airplane was kept in an underground storage facility about 100 miles from London, where various other national treasures were secured. In 1948, the airplane was returned to the United States and permanently installed in the Smithsonian Institution Museum in Washington, D.C., where it resides today as pictured here. It had taken four years, 1900 to 1903. At Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, they had endured violent storms, accidents, one disappointment after another, and public indifference or ridicule. To get to and from their remote sand dune testing grounds at Kill Devil Hills, they made five round trips from Dayton, a total of 7,000 miles by train and boat, all to fly little more than half a mile. No matter, they had done it. Shortly after their successful four flights on December 17, Orville sent this historic telegram from Kitty Hawk, the Kitty Hawk Weather Office, to his father and sister Catherine, who became the first non-Kitty Hawk residents to learn about their success. And success it most certainly was, as shown in this December 18 headline in the Dayton Herald newspaper. What happened that day in 1903, in the stiff winds and cold of the Outer Banks in less than two hours, was one of the turning points of history, the beginning of change for the world far greater than any of those present could possibly have imagined. With their homemade machine, Wilbur and Orville had shown without a doubt that man could fly. By the time they returned from Kitty Hawk, the Wright brothers knew they had solved the crucial problem of mechanical flight. They immediately began the process of obtaining their basic flying machine U.S. patent, which they had initially filed on March 23, 1903, and which sought to protect their wing warping system. It, it took more than three years for the patent to be granted on May 22, 1906, pictured here. In the following years, the Wright brothers completed thousands of flights in improved versions of their airplane. Although they held patents on several of their innovations, drawn out legal battles ensued when other inventors began stealing their ideas to build newer airplanes. The decade after the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk in 1903 witnessed a wide range of reactions to the new technology. Human flight was so significant and revolutionary a breakthrough that its influence went well beyond the aeronautical community. The airplane had meaning for everyone. From popular enthusiasm for pilots and their aerial exhibitions, to the commercial and military potential of aviation, to the broad and cult cultural application implications of flight, and to the artistic expression it inspired. Wilbur Wright died of typhoid infection on May 30, 1912, at the age of 45. Orville Wright 
died of natural causes in 1948 at age 77. And now you know the rest of the story. And I thank you for your interest in this great moment in history. <laughs>